welcome to the Ghosts of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 219 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 75 of A Storm of Swords, which is Sam 4. Uh, I think that might be the longest break we've had between chapters for a single character. I'd make it 29 chapters without Sam. Wow. Well, he must have been moving pretty slow. Yeah. Uh, after leaving the <laughs> night. <is> Sam. <laughs> Well, as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. Unless you're a sustainer, then you'll get our spoiler section, which is in this episode. Uh, and hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way to all of you. We'll summarize what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information about the characters and other things in this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing okay. I'm trying. Why? What's I'm the matter? Trying. Do I, I'm just, I'm trying to get into the holiday spirit. We're, we're December 6th. I, I've got all the, all the Christmas lights up in the front of the house. They're all well, dancing to, be to fair, music. To be fair, you've done three weeks of hard labor. No wonder you're not <laughs> in the Christmas spirit. I'm exhausted. <laughs> exactly. I know what your house looks like, Mr. Griswold. I, we usually do start the weekend of, after Thanksgiving, and I finished uh, like three days ago. So, you know, it was like solid two weeks or whatever. I've week, got, maybe. You can see, actually, you see me on video. No one else oh, yes. a good podcast. I saw a big pile of boxes down from the attic. That's that's my effort so far. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> well, it's a step. You got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wait, I've discovered that most of those boxes are now filled with uh, previous year's wrapping paper because we're too <laughs> cheap to use fr- new wrapping paper. So we, use, we reuse it. Uh, and, oh, like this box is full of it. We're more than we could ever use in our lifetime. So when you say last year's wrapping paper, do you mean the stuff we actually used to wrap presents, or the stuff that Correct. wasn't used? Oh. Plus some left over unused, but mostly okay. used uh-huh. and to be used again. So when you hand someone a gift, you say, "Okay, unwrap this very gently, please. I want the paper back." Yes, and also I say, where it says Joe. Ignore that. It's for you. <laughs> hey, that works. Whatever works. You know, it's, it's the thought that counts. Exactly. But, uh, you know, the, and the, the thought didn't season. go into the wrapping. Let's be honest. Right. I mean, yes. Uh, now, have you ever had a stretch of days where all the little things just seem to be conspiring against you? Yeah, I call those weeks. <laughs> <laughs> a day that ends in Y. <laughs> I've just had this weird stretch. Well, for one thing, I know you, you feel very little sympathy for me when I talk about my sports franchises that I support, uh, you know, not uh, <laughs> not reaching my Go standards. On. But they, it's just been a terrible run. Every team that I support has been just on a, a losing skid for the past couple of weeks. So that's not helping. But for instance, when was the last time you spilled a full cup of water? It's been a couple of weeks, but it's it's been weeks, not months. Okay. Well And and I have a giant cup of water, so when you it do. goes, yes, it's that a is a real pain. Well, twice in as many days I have knocked over a full cup of water. And I'm like, what? I can't even tell you the last time that I knocked over a cup of liquid doesn't have to be water, any liquid. But yet I've done it twice in two days. And then today at the sink my my sink is one of those faucets that kind of go up in like a a metal spiral and then yes. it comes down to the nozzle yes. so you can move it around and stuff. Yes. Uh Stacy turns the water on. I'm up in uh, the second floor where I work from and I, I hear her shout up to me and I say, "Yeah." And she said, "I broke something." So, I come down. The entire faucet, the the entire metal spiral that leads it to the uh, the end of the faucet has completely been dislocated from the rest of the faucet and water was pouring everywhere. I've only ever met Dr. Stacy Banner, but <laughs> whenever she's alone, she turns into the the Hulk, basically. She breaks yeah. things like I've never known people break things. Yes, our listeners might recall her breaking our entire shower system. Exactly. I mean, to the point where the bathroom had to be replaced <laughs> 
Yes, had to in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe it's just water. I, I, I just, you know, I was. It's just like weird things keep happening that either derail what I was about to do, or just like conspire against me in general. So I'm fighting that. I'm fighting that right now. So my water, I, I have like a, like a t- twenty four ounce, you know, like like a, like a liter cup of water yes, and i always sure. have it by the side of my bed so typically when i spill a whole cup of water it <laughs> is at 3 a.m and then i'm scrambling to mop it up well that would be worse delirious both, yes both of my uh, water spills in the past two days have been during uh at least awake hours uh-huh, so uh-huh. <laughs> so um a story that didn't make it to the podcast last week was about my my little sister and her car and how uh, I think our, our sustainers got the extended version, so they heard it. But I'll I'll recap for everybody. Um, she got an electric car, and it doesn't have the range she needs for the driving that she does. Uh huh. Right. Essentially, yes. that's it. And she eventually she wrote she phoned them up and complained about it. And would you believe her car dealership is letting her change cars? Wow. She's only had it for a few weeks, and they said, "Oh, clearly this was the wrong car for you." Get and out. Let him change cars. Do you remember when I uh, got my van, that whole fiasco, when we, we bought a different car? And that yeah, night, that's a rhetorical Stacey... question, McKelly. Yeah, that's true. It was, it, in your defense, it was 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Children have been born and become middle teenagers <laughs> in the amount of times since this story happened. But a very quick version, we bought a car that night. Stacy says, I hate the car. I don't want this car. So I call the next day and say, my wife hates the car. Is there anything we can do? And they said no. And it turned into this big, long, drawn out fiasco and lawsuits were threatened on both sides. And ultimately, they did let us give them our car back and get the van. And good thing it did. It worked out because we've yeah, had yeah. this van for 15 years. Yeah. But you wouldn't believe what I had to go through to get that to happen. And Lucy just calls up and they're like, sure, bring it back. I will say, just to give some context, she because her partner is, her spouse is in a wheelchair, she bought the car through a, a organization that is, gets people connected with uh, accessible cars. Okay. And it was okay. them. They said, okay, this car is wrong for you. You can have a new one. So okay. it wasn't directly the dealership. Plus, I will say that that whole thing is exactly 180 degrees away from the typical American British experience. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. <laughs> because um, um, in America, customers just get to walk all over the people they're buying from. And in the UK, it's the exact opposite. They are doing you a favor and <laughs> you better be grateful. Sometimes it does feel like that here in the uh, States as well when you when you uh, get the, the wrong person on the wrong day anyway. Yeah. So what'd you think of my... Uh, so we've talked about our, our friend Dan, the one that uh, designed our n- new uh, GOH design that has been flying off the shelves on our merchandise. Uh, he also did, I think I mentioned this last week, he did family photos for my family. You did mention. And... Uh, he's been giving them back to us in bunches. And today he sent out to to me and my family, but also to Simon and some of my, our, our work friends, photos of... of can, can I mention yes, that, that, yes, yes. that text group that he sent it to is still you, me, and some phone numbers that I don't know who they are. <laughs> because of when Carson because... deleted all the, your contacts. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I can tell you who they are off air. <laughs> but I now know who Dan is. If I could bother to go back and put it in, I, at least I would know who Dan is because he sent all the photos. And yes, yes, they looked really good. I mean, they looked completely professional. And and you're you guys are a handsome family, so you know it, they were they were terrific photos. But go on. There's a funny part to this. <laughs> there, there's one little one, one little uh, gotcha in these photos is Dan photoshopped various hairstyles onto my bald head. And they were quite funny. Some were pretty well done. Some they, they were all really well done. I mean, some of them were pretty outlandish and clearly not real. But the Photoshop yes. skills were excellent. I mean, they were. There, there were a couple where I was just like, 
and who is that young handsome man with his arm around <laughs> Stacy? I was like, wait a minute. That's what he yeah. would look like thirty years ago. <laughs> the the Fabio hair one was was probably my favorite. It was so funny. I I couldn't stop laughing at it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll I'll try to remember to to share a couple on you our should. social yes, media yes, as far as. I would definitely share the ones where you look good. That the, the, <laughs> the first two, basically, I thought you looked really good. The, yes, one I looked rather distinguished. And yeah. uh, one, Stacy said, yeah, that's pretty much what you'd look like if you had hair. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, anyway. That's the one with a lot of product in it, I noticed. So that's, what she, <laughs> right. that's what she thinks you'd be like, theoretically. Yes, right, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, let us get down to business. How did we leave Samuel Tarley? Last we saw of Sam directly, he, Gilly, and her baby were saved from whites by a night watch blacks wearing, elk riding, cold handed stranger. But since <laughs> then, we've seen him in a brand chapter in which he helped Bran and Co. to pass under the wall through the black gate of the night fort. Jojen knew that Bran was the person that Cold Hands was seeking, and Sam figured out who Bran was. But out of friendship to John, he would not betray them or reveal that they had passed through the wall. So, McKelly, why don't we give the summary of this one? Do you have any news about summaries? I do. I have a mea culpa that I must offer to our dear friend Jenny. Jenny wrote a fantastic summary for last week's Aria 13 episode. And I just was rushing and totally forgot that she had written it. Ironically, we rushed and did a lot more work than we had to do. Yes, I wrote that summary. Well, you started it and I finished it at like a, uh, close to midnight. And here we had a wonderful summary already written for us. So mm. my but apologies, I think we've Jenny. come up with a with a plan now for, for, for this in the future. And I think it should stop us from making yes. that mistake at least. Agreed. And I've told Jenny that we've come up with this plan. So hopefully we <laughs> follow through on it. <laughs> So anyway, here goes the summary that I wrote last night at close to midnight. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see how accurate it is and how much. It's, it, it's sense not it Jenny makes. quality. Let's put it that way. Yeah, right. So Sam watches as Gilly breastfeeds a baby boy. However, the boy isn't hers. It's Mance Raider's son. Sam remembers Gilly, the baby, and his trek from the night fort to Castle Black. Along the way, they were met by Sam's Night's Watch brothers riding to Castle Black from the Shadow Tower. Sam was so relieved to see his brothers, he broke down and wept. It was from these men that he learned of the battle beneath the wall and Stannis's role as savior. Despite the heads up, he was unprepared for the state of Castle Black. There was actually a king in the king's tower. Banners flew from everywhere in the castle and men crowded into buildings that had been empty for years. It did not take long for him to learn the difference between queen's men and king's men. He learned of the red woman Melisande and that she burned a man alive to ensure that Stannis had good weather for their trip to Eastwatch. Sam isn't alone watching Gilly feed the baby. The baby's aunt Val looks on as well as John. Val's heard that Melisandre plans to give Mance to the flames. She asks that she be allowed to see the king beyond the wall and show him his son. John is sympathetic but points out that if Mance wasn't the king's prisoner, he'd be dead already as a Night's Watch deserter. He'll ask about Mance seeing the baby, and that's about the best he can do for her. As Sam and John take their leave, John notices the squeeze Sam gives Gilly's hand. Outside, John asks Sam about his feelings for Gilly. He admits she's a good, kind person, but knows there's no future for them. He tells John that he's considering sending Gilly and the baby to Horn Hill with a letter telling his mother that the baby is his bastard. Sam's, not John's. That would be <laughs> roping John into a plan that he had no... <laughs> John sees merit in that plan, as long as the boy proves to have fighting prowess to impress Lord Randall. The men stop before going their separate ways. Sam to his steward duties, John to the yard to train. John's been working with the younger recruits since Alistair Thorne has not returned to such duties. It's really all John's allowed to do. Bowen Marsh removed him from duty, fearing John as a turncloak. Sam reassures John that it's only Thorne's friends who believe that. Unfortunately, one such friend is Janice Slint, who's been climbing up the vote tally for the next Lord Commander. 
Slint is still running well behind Dennis Malister and Cotter Pike, but John insists that Slint has been making significant strides for days. He tells Sam he doesn't even dream of Ghost anymore. Instead, he dreams of Rob and his father, but he's separated from them by a wall. It nearly kills Sam to not tell John about Bran being alive, but he thrice swore a vow of secrecy before leaving the night fort, so he holds his tongue. Did you like how I put thrice in there for you? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> After dinner, the men prepare for the next Lord Commander vote. Bowen Marsh announces he's withdrawing his candidacy and supports Slint. When the voting ends and the men filter out of the hall, Sam, Clytus, and Maester Eamon count up the results. Malister and Pike still hold first and second place, but both lost ground to Slint, who gained more ground with Marsh's backing. That night, Sam talks to Pip and Gren about the vote. Sam sees that if Pike and Malister could choose between themselves one candidate, that man would have nearly two-thirds of the vote required to be named Lord Commander. The boys point out that those two guys dislike each other, so one backing down in support of the other is unlikely. Sam knows both men care about the well-being of the Night's Watch and only differ on ideas for what's best for the organisation. Sam would talk to them and make them see this if only he wasn't so craven. Now, huh. you often tell me that the last sentence of a chapter is very uh, portentous, I but I didn't feel that yes. this particular one was. I mean, just Sam feeling a bit nervous about going to see his superiors and asking one of them to step down in the vote for Lord Commander. I, I guess we we'll do. Yes, I do often say that, and I thought the same thing when when uh -huh. I got to the end of this chapter. I thought, "That's it." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now well, I will say, who knows? Maybe they'll draw their swords on him. You what? <laughs> <laughs> I will say when we get to the very end of this episode, I will give a conjecture as to why I think this might be. But I'm going to save it till the very end. Exciting. Now, you put in the discussion notes that this is a rare triple POV trifecta at, uh, Castle, at Castle Black. And it took me a good three minutes to figure out who the third one was. I had oh. John and Sam, but <laughs> Davos doesn't get a single mention in this chapter, I don't think. He does doesn't. And, and so we don't know if he's there. But if he is, then yeah, we've got three POVs all in one castle, yeah. which is pretty rare. The, Apart from King's Landing, perhaps. I mean, yeah, the last was King's Landing before Ned died, when we had Ned, Arya, and Sansa. No, because Tyrion wasn't there yet before Ned died. Surely there was at least one chapter when Tyrion and Sansa, and one other. It was after Ned died. It was remember oh, Tywin wow. sent Tyrion down there to rule because Ned had been beheaded instead of sent to uh, the Night's Watch. I suppose you could argue that the Battle of the Blackwater... We had Davos and Tyrion, Tyrion and, and Sansa, Sansa was still around. Yes. But they weren't yes. really in the same place. It's a stretch. Right. I thought about huh. that one, but I discounted Davos as yeah. not being, you know, with them. Now, the most that I can recall was the early days at Winterfell in Game at of Winterfell. Thrones when we had right. basically all the Starks and Tyrion, you know? Yeah, yeah. We had Ned, Cat, John, Arya, Bran. Sansa didn't get her first POV until they had left Winterfell, I believe. Okay. But, uh, yeah. you know, but hey, still a lot once of a POV chat, Once a POV character, <laughs> always a POV character. So she right. counts. I mean. In that case, we got Th uh, Theon was there as well. So we, we had basically oh, wow, everybody, yeah. <laughs> yeah. except for Daenerys. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice that Sam, John, and Ed and Gren and Pip are all reunited. That's uh, yeah. That, that's sweet for them. They, they, the chances of them all being reunited were pretty small when they were north of the wall. Yes, yes. It's uh, yeah. Each one of them likely should have died. I think, except for Pip. I think Pip stayed behind. I think Pip did stay behind. Yeah. But all the rest of them, yeah they're, yeah, they're very lucky that all of them survived. Yeah. Now, Sam and Gilly, they trek from the Night Fort to Castle Black, but they get rescued along the way by Night's Watch brothers. But Sam says, well, he, he thinks to himself, so he's saying to us, that they traveled from the Night Fort to Deep Lake and from Deep Lake to Queensgate. So basically what happened is uh, the Night Fort to Queensgate goes... Night Fort, Deep Lake, Queen's Gate, Castle Black. So they right. were rescued one castle before making it back to Castle Black. So okay. 
you know, if they had just hung out in the night for it a little longer, they would have had to do less walking, I guess. That's ultimately. true. Although the, the, the riders might have ridden past while they were asleep, you know. <laughs> yes, that would have been a problem. <laughs> uh, so uh, the news is that Mance is for the flames. Now, we know that Melisandre likes to burn stuff, um, in particular people, in particular people who claim to have royal blood. Um, yes, yes, she does. It's hard to imagine. I can certainly imagine Sam turning a blind eye to this because Sam is craven enough to squelch anything down. But Jon Snow can't be too thrilled with that uh but the other question i have about it i mean i mean so we'll see how john reacts to that but the question i have is to what end i mean what do stannis and melisande want here i mean are they going to right make the wall grow taller i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah well first of all we learned that mance is alive we didn't even know if he was alive at That's the end true, of the yeah. last john chapter because uh he was we saw his horse get killed and we didn't know what happened to Mance, but, uh, and yet we had discussed in that chapter, you asked, uh, if I thought that Melisandre might want to fry Mance for good luck. And it certainly seems that they consider him, <laughs> can consider Just him a king, you know, luck. that, that was the thing. Like, would they consider a wildling king to be actually a king? And, yeah. you know, he has united the huge wildling community under his leadership, more than Stannis has at the moment, that's for sure. So, But the thing is, again, again, with the burning of the king's blood, it, it has power, but it seems to have remote power. It seems to, like, be able to do things at a remote. What Stannis really needs, because, again, if he killed Tommen with Mance's blood, then Melis, not Melisande, uh, Marcella would become queen, you know, right. and he'd be back to square one. He'd have to find another king to throw on the pyre to kill her. <laughs> it doesn't help. There's always one more to replace that with, that you got rid of. He needs to take the Iron Throne. He needs men at arms and he needs direction and purpose. And I'm not sure how Burning Man's helps with any of that, really. Well, you know, I was thinking about that too. And I was wondering, though they wanted to burn Edric Storm because Melisandre promised that burning Edric would wake the stone dragons. Will Mance, ah. burning Mance, wake the stone dragons? If, right. Could, because she had been taken, you know, just drips and drabs off of him through leeches, through Edric, that is, through leeches. And she wanted to burn his whole his whole yeah. being in order to re uh, release the stone dragons. Well, this is a whole king. Will right. That, will that do the it? The one thing is... Is that what they're thinking? If... If the stone dragons were not metaphorical but literal, um, they might wake up on Dragonstone and wonder what they're supposed to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the the Castellan on Dragonstone would be like, oh, I didn't get instructions for this. <laughs> Send a raven to the north quickly. <laughs> I was told to take the garbage out every Tuesday. Nothing about dragons. And feed the fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. But, but maybe the, therefore the plan is to take Mance back to Dragonstone if if it is a literal thing oh yeah that could be that, yeah. there's some sense to that now yeah. Val so Val has heard that Mance is to be fed to the fire and he she wants Mance to see his son before this happens that's her request and John says I'll see what I can do that's the best I can offer you yeah do, do we get an explanation of why Gilly is nursing the baby. So what well, we about don't. Because, because yeah. she's talking to Val. And in my mind, I was like, oh, Val's the mother. But that's not true. Dala is the mother, right? Val is Dala's sister. Yes, right. So there's no sign of Dala. She might be recovering from giving birth in a field at minus 20 Fahrenheit. But I'm worried that she might not have come through and nobody even bothered to mention because she's just a wildling. Yes. It's you're right. It is not explicitly stated, but there is no mention or sign of Dala. So as you say, either she's recovering, maybe under the care of Maester Aemon, or she didn't survive. Yeah, but still, I mean, there's a reason to breastfeed from the mother if she is recovering. I mean, it, you know, it's you, the milk needs to flow to keep flowing for later, and so yeah. Uh, I'm worried. Yes, me too. So, John, not the midwife we hoped he was. <laughs> By the way, actually, this this 
the, the whole first page of this chapter is people watching Gilly breastfeeding. It is, and, yes. <laughs> Sam was not alone watching Gilly breastfeed. There was a whole crowd of Night's Watch brothers who didn't get to see this kind of thing very often. <laughs> you know. um, it, it reminded me, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but I have an unerring ability to, to find breastfeeding. I, it happens to me. I, I walk into breastfeeding all the time. And I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's just, I mean, I promise it's not perversion. It is, it is cluelessness. And I think slightly dodgy eyesight. Like oh. I see a lady that I know and I, oh, and I walk towards her and I get like within four feet. Oh. And then I, oh, oh no. Sorry. Oh no. Yeah. That's awkward. That, that all the makes time. for an awkward scene. <laughs> all, all the time. It's, it must've happened 25 times in my life. It is incredible oh. how often. Oh. Whenever, whenever <laughs> well. we see someone breastfeeding, Carson says, yeah, well, <laughs> happened again. <laughs> <laughs> that is something. Yeah, I, I can see how eyesight might play a, a role in that. Yeah, I mean, I see a person like I might know that person and I walk towards them and then it seems like I'm just coming to have a look. Right, sure. It's not yeah. good. Mm. No. So they, we learn that Stannis left Selyse, his wife, at Eastwatch. So he brought her across the water, but then left her at Eastwatch. Uh, and, but did bring Melisande with him to Castle Black. Uh-huh. Right. Now, a lot, of this, a lot of the second half of that is to do with the, what happened on the Battle of the Blackwater, because her, he for, blames her absence for why it all went pear-shaped. For sure. But bringing Selyse halfway and then leaving her feels a little... I don't know. Selyse is very devout. She probably doesn't think about the fact that Stannis might be into Melisande um, and doesn't think and probably thinks it's good that she is, you know, spending time with her husband. But it feels yeah. a little cruel to leave her, especially Eastwatch. It sounds god awful there. <laughs> well, that's why I I put interesting in quotes there, because <laughs> I, I wondered how Selyse feels about the stannis melisandre relationship is is she cool with their close relationship is there a natural sense of jealousy that these two spend so much time together and she's left out in this instance here you've got to imagine there's a human jealousy but perhaps it's swamped by the sort of religious devotion right that could very well she is just his priestess i don't care if they spend time together right And, and could something extramarital be going on with Stannis and Melisandre. He he doesn't seem the type. He's such a rigid rule follower, and we know he tried to outlaw brothels and King's Landing, so it feels like he's got a very strong sense of values. And... Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I remember what Carice Van Houten, whatever she was called, looked like in Game of Thrones, and so it <laughs> seems very plausible to me that he is. <laughs> yes well yes and they i i'm pretty sure they describe her as quite beautiful in this right. story as well so right. you know there is that stannis for all all his rigidness and all his standing for justice and doing the right thing he is still a human yes at what you know what it boils down to it and susceptible yes. to hormones and emotions and such yes all right, so I think it's a, quite the idea of Sam's to send Gilly and the baby to Horn Hill to be raised by the uh, Tarleys as Sam's bastard. There's a couple of things going for it. One is safety for Gilly and the baby, definitely a good idea. The other one yeah. is that subtle, like, hey, Dad, see what I did? Yes, kind of. Yeah, he kind of mentions that, that he thinks his dad might actually be proud of him. Exactly, yeah, he would. Randall would like be like, what? He doesn't look anything <laughs> like me. I de- I deny it. <laughs> that and is especially a, that when he, is when he a fear when he when he grows up to be a roistering womanizing fighting <laughs> monster like Craster. <laughs> he's gonna be like that is not Sam's kid. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's hope that the uh, the nurture helps yeah. that over the the nature. <laughs> but, uh, basically, I felt like there were two elements to this idea that sam has here there's the feelings that sam has for gilly and then there's the plan that sam has so you know john notices sam's feelings for gilly and i was thinking he probably sees it because of his own struggle 
that he had with yeah. his feelings for Egret and can identify, oh boy, been down that road. And Sam admits that he is fond of her, and he thinks to himself that he almost misses being out in the wilderness alone with her and the baby versus in his warm, safe bed at night. And, uh, you know, there was definitely a problem that everyone knew was coming, just like with Johnny the Gret. There's, yeah, yeah. There's no easy resolution here. And, you know, we're still unclear how she feels about Sam. And he is as well. He thinks, I told her about the vows and what it means, and I don't know if she if that made her happy or sad. I so. don't know. If, if he's trying to impress her, I don't know if bursting into tears when the Night's <laughs> Watch hoving to view is the best way <laughs> to go. Yeah, I did have that thought as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but they did have an opportunity to flee, and, and he could have lived his life as long as he could have gotten away with it with Gilly because everyone assumed he was dead. Yeah. They got through the night fort. They could have just just kept going south. I would one piece of advice would have been change your clothes. Please change your clothes. If you can't make it to Molestown to uh make it to Simon and McKelly's haberdashery, find a clothes on a line somewhere. <laughs> we have, we have a sign outside. Open through all of this. Right. I mean, plus we'd be doing a roaring trade with deserters, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. And, and then we get to the the plan part, which is to send Gilly and the baby to Horn Hill. And uh, he, this is when he, uh, you know, he asks, he opens the conversation by asking John, uh, is, is it okay to lie for a good purpose? And when he said that, I thought he was trying to ab- absolve himself from not telling Sam, not telling John that Bran was still alive. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's was, that's where I maybe thought he there was, was a little going double with meaning that. there actually. Uh, maybe, yeah. Mm. But the the plan is it's not ideal because he still loses her, but you know at least he can feel secure in the thought that she will be safe and happy He's somewhere. a sworn brother of the Night's Watch, McKelly. Right. Right. He's yeah, a, he's exactly. already lost her. He lost her before he ever met her when he took those vows. Yes, yes he did. It, um, it will be so important for Gilly to never stray from the story, though, because I would true. very much fear for her fate. Apart from the out. fact, by the time he's like 10 years old, he's clearly going to be Randall's favorite grandchild. <laughs> so, Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> at that point, he won't care. Although I, I do say I am there worried about how Randall will react. And I find it totally understandable because I, I myself have some mixed feelings about subjecting Gilly and the baby to that man's authority based on the stories we've heard of how he treats, has is, treated Sam. This is Gilly, daughter, wife of Craster. Well, know? yes. Gilly probably be all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gilly's a tough cookie. She'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, but what they don't know is that Randall is currently in Maidenpool on the far side of Westeros. So who knows how long he'll be tied up in that situation uh, you pose the question with how much cat resented john why did she never send him to squire given that you know that there's it's clearly possible for people i mean they are theorizing that a bastard would be welcomed and allowed to squire um, yes i wonder if that's a ned thing i wonder if that's wanting john close uh-huh yeah yeah john says to sam when sam proposes the idea that it's not unknown for bastards to squire and be raised to knighthood and that's when I had that thought. We know the torment that John suffered because of Kat's resentment of him. And yes, I think it is. A lot of it is is what you said. It's understandable to want your son near you. But on the other hand, it's also bordering on cruel to subject him to Kat's treatment his whole life. So, yeah. you know, it, it seemed that based on some of the conversations we'd heard Ned have, it seemed that he wanted John to help Rob run Winterfell whenever Rob took over, kind of be his hand of the king, you know, hand of the Lord. Just while we're talking about that, it just make does make me wonder if Ned ever considered sending Rob and John off to, to uh, be fostered somewhere else, you know, right. He have, was, he was. Yeah. Not for a specific yeah. reason, I don't think, other than to get life experience, you know. River Run right. could have been interesting for them. And he was 
he was the second son when he was sent off to Squire. Uh, so maybe true. that has something to do yeah. with it. But John is a second son. You know, he's he's not the heir, so yeah. he could have been sent off. Yeah. Um, so you know, what, what, one thing I wanted to mention about Melisandre way back, a little bit ago when we were talking about her is that Gren said to Sam that Melisandre burned a man alive so that Stannis would have favorable winds for his, his their trip to Eastwatch. And there was no indication of who the man was or even if the story was true because it was coming from Gren. But Alistair Florent was still yeah. locked up in Dragonstone last we heard. Um, yeah. And there's a bit of irony here because Gren is telling Sam this information and Alistair Florent is Sam's grandfather. Huh. So there's small there's a world. familiar yes. Now I we don't know who it is, but it's there. There was someone in the dungeons. Yeah. So. When when you started saying that, I I went. I couldn't remember whether it was Alistair or Axel, but I remembered the the Florent in the in the dungeons was probably the most likely candidate for that. Yes, who happens to be Sam's grandfather. So isn't yeah. that kind of something? So. This is a Sam chapter, but there's quite a bit about John. I mean, John is one of the very few people ever to see his life enhanced by going on a suicide <laughs> mission. Um, yes. He went from absolutely doomed to enough people dissenting about his treatment to earn a suicide mission to hero of the battle below the wall, rescuer of the Horn of Winter, and midwife to the prince beyond the wall. <laughs> and He's possibly, racking up titles. <laughs> and possibly He's grave racking... digger to the, to the queen beyond the wall as well. Perhaps. Yeah. He's racking up titles like Daenerys would. Yeah. <laughs> I I gave him most of those. He probably isn't actually <laughs> claiming them. Um, but yes, now so now having spent days in an ice dungeon, he's now training the Green Recruits, which uh, Sir Alistair apparently is not doing it because he's in a funk about the fact he's unpopular. He should perhaps think about his actions. You know, right? Yeah, but maybe <laughs> maybe there's a cause and effect here. You know, <laughs> take a moment and ponder that. Yeah, uh, it, a lot of it's because he doesn't, John's not allowed to do anything else. Yeah, and what's strange to me about that, by the way, is that Bowen Marsh is head of the stewards, right? Right, yeah. So he's preventing Lord John Stewart. from doing his duties of emptying chamber pots <laughs> and banishing him to training the recruits. It seems like that's kind of an upgrade on what John was doing. I would, I would banish him to do his actual job. <laughs> right uh, he's in a pickle because he was lord commander uh, gr mormont steward he is not the lord commander anymore so john needs a new uh, like, True. role as it is yeah so but uh so slint and thorn have been spreading rumors that john was in league with mance and that's why mance wasn't killed which of course is nonsense he went out to fight in a battle and wasn't killed but yeah. uh you know and no return of Ghost. I, I was kind of hoping that the end of hostilities here would bring Ghost back, but no sign of Ghost. I, yeah. I just imagined him slinking along the wall, waiting for his opportunity to get through the wall, but hasn't happened yet. Yeah, we, we conjectured before that maybe the wall, the, the magic that's in the wall was preventing them you know, being able to connect. But since we've made that conjecture, uh, John's been on top of the wall. And he's been north of the wall, it's and he's been down, under the wall. <laughs> come down a cage off the front of the wall so he could see right. him for miles around. And no change in his connection with yeah. Ghost, so that's that's not great. And he's not even dreaming of him anymore, so that's a worry that Ghost might have perished, perhaps. Uh, yes. But back to Sam, we learned a little bit more about Cold Hands, which we didn't hear the last time um, we saw Sam. But he specifically told Sam to look for and send Bran. I mean, it was not like you'll find somebody in the night for. He, he he swore him to secrecy that the child that he would find is believed dead and he needs to stay that way. So Cold right. Hands knew who was in the night for and who was being sent through the wall. Um, that oath, he took it seriously enough that he's not telling John. And that is a harsh one for Sam to hold. Yeah, because you could, it is. You could promise John to secrecy and he would hold it close for sure. Right. I get the basic premise of the, that the world thinks Bran dead and let's not ruin that and cause people to hunt him. But is John a concern there? Yeah. Uh, I now, mean, I maybe... could possibly 
uh, you're probably going to say what I'm going to say. That you yeah, could, I bet you I could am. see him going after Bran right. because he worries that Bran would be in danger. But I'm not sure that's the that that's the people we're trying to prevent from getting to Bran. Yeah, yeah. You know, it would be funny if he did like just jump on a horse and ride through the wall and rescue Bran, <laughs> bring Bran back. And then sort of once again face the music at Castle Black for his desertion. <laughs> so you killed Corin Harfan. <laughs> you broke right the world with the wildlings. <laughs> and you tell us it was all because Corin Halfhand. Did Corin Halfhand tell you to chase your brother? <laughs> <laughs> Is that who told the you that? The chamber pots are overflowing and you come <laughs> back with a kid. I will say I would be wary of breaking the oath to cold hands. He, you know, he he had to swear three oaths: one to Brand, one to Jojen, one to uh, cold hands. Cold hands. The Brand one, yeah, okay. The Jojen one, mostly it'd just be because the kid is kind of weird and creepy that yeah. I'd be a little bit concerned about breaking yeah. that oath. It's cold hands seems like someone you wouldn't want to disappoint. But he can't cross the wall. So stay this side of the wall. You <laughs> might be okay. Right. Yeah. But, but that being oh, said, what a lift it would be for John to learn exactly. this. Exactly. It's it's so harsh, and and Sam knows how harsh it is. I mean, like, yeah. he's he's a man dying of thirst, and you've got a bottle of water in your hand. You know. Right. Could, I was thinking, could Sam get creative and maybe have Gilly let it slip? <laughs> I didn't hear any mention of her swearing any oaths. So you know, he could be like, "Oh, these wildlings, they can never." Keep secrets. Uh, you know, but uh, could that be why we have no sign of Ghost? Could he be going to help Bran oh. reach the Three-Eyed Crow? Maybe Summer has a connection with Ghost now that they're both on the northern side of the wall. Interesting. And they've mm. gotten together. Um, so Cold Hands even knew that Bran was supposed to be dead, which is... How did he get that piece of information? I mean, that's like... That's gossip in the north, but <laughs> when I say the north, I mean the south. The south of the wall, north. Exactly, yeah. But that got he across must... the wall to cold hands, and it didn't seem like... I guess he he's some kind of warg abilities, right? Because, I mean, he rides an elk, and he has ravens that be, uh, work to his Do behest his... as well. Yes. He must be getting that information from the Three-Eyed Crow, because uh, he knew yeah. for some reason to go to the Night Fort and pick up yeah. Bran and company. So, you know, maybe he's being sent by the Three-Eyed Crow, and the Three-Eyed Crow gave him that information. So, John seems to be temporarily reprieved from the hanging that seemed imminent. But if Slint is climbing the poles and might become the Lord Commander, presumably Stannis isn't going to stay there forever. It doesn't mean that John's reprieve might only be temporary. Yeah, that's true. I, I hadn't really thought about it from that aspect. Yeah, that... If... If Slint becomes Lord Commander, that would be really bad for John. It would be best if that happened. It would be best if John transfers to a different castle. If yeah, if yeah, he can which which Slint might that. might allow because I I think Slint is vindictive and nasty, but probably doesn't want him, probably doesn't want to actually murder him and doesn't but wouldn't want him under his feet as a constant reminder of Ned Stark. You know, could be yeah. We do see during during dinner before the vote, we see Slint and Thorn working the room with. Bowen Marsh and Othel Yarwick, both former candidates with a following. Right. So, you know, I, I, I will say the voting system that they describe here. So I'll, I'll tell you the voting system real quick. Basically, they have they have like uh, cauldrons behind a heavy curtain and each brother takes a token and drops it into the bucket that's designated for right. that, you know, for that candidate. And on top of that, though, you can drop uh, tokens in for friends or entire garrisons like uh, Malister and Pike are doing. And a person could, seems like they could very easily pull tokens from one pot and place it in another pot. And I, also, I, who's to I say the that the... Uh, who's to theory. say all the men from the Shadow Tower in Eastwatch want to vote for their commander? Well, true, true. I have a theory about that, though. They, they make the buckets very deep, so you'd actually hear them struggling to clamber in to get the tokens <laughs> out. That must be it. Only, like, Small Paul would have been able to yeah, uh, yeah. successfully do it. <laughs> so Sam, while he's thinking about Bran, mentions that he's going to, that he's, Bran is going to seek the Three-Eyed Crow. 
Now, he, he heard that from Bran. He may have also heard it from Coldhands, but he literally we know he heard it from Bran because we witnessed that. But does Sam have any understanding of what that means? Has that been explained to Sam, or is he just regurgitating words that he's heard? I can't imagine he has any idea what Bran's talking right. about. I, I right. think I, re- I didn't reread the chapter, but I, I think I recall from that chapter, the Bran chapter in the Shadow Tower, I mean, in the Night Fort, uh, Sam Bran talking like Sam knew what he was going on about and thinking, boy, I bet Sam has no idea what Bran's going on about right now. Yeah. So um, the first round of voting that happened before we the chapter joined, with Malister was at 213 and Pike at 187 with Slint trailing quite far behind at 74. But the vote that happens on camera here, um, Malister drops 10 to 203, Pike drops almost 20 to 169 and slint jumps from 74 to 137 mostly because of bowen marsh's votes which we get 49 right. votes for bowen marsh transferred over to slint so he's still in third place but he is clearly closing the gap and if malister and pike keep fighting you can kind of imagine that those the yep leftover votes might come slint's way and eventually if one of those drops out they might drop out in flavor of slint which is it seems terribly short-sighted I mean, I don't know yes, how much they does. hate each other, but they, they both know the Night's Watch and Slint doesn't. That is it, right? I mean, that's the issue, is that Slint doesn't have a clue what's going on up here. He's been here for a hot minute. He doesn't understand the the dynamics between the Night's Watch and the Wildlings or the threats from the North aside from the Wildlings. I do think, I have a theory here, that Thorne spent some time in our... Um, uh, franchise PR firm while in King's Landing. <laughs> and um, he is actually spreading the rumor that Slint was a very successful administrator of the gold cloaks in King's Landing. Uh-huh. And that is perfect training. Although he's got he's got to learn the ropes of the Night's Watch, it's perfect training to be Lord Commander. So that could be working in his favor. It could paper well, over a lot of the cracks of his uh, application anyway. I guess so. That seems to be what's happening. Is I, I've been a commander of a large group before and i can i can do it here right situation right. I, and i have experience be, yeah being an administrator of and particularly because the night's watch and the gold cloaks are somewhat similar in that they are a force that has a sort of like a, a purview of you know keeping the peace and law and order they're not an army per se right but yes. yeah Still, well, he one seems thing, like a terrible choice. Yes, he really does. And I'm sure, you know, when you first meet him, he can probably, uh, you know, turn on some sort of charm or something and smooth you into thinking this guy knows what he's talking about. But if you spend any time with him, you'll realize he's uh, he's not what, uh, what you want to be the leader of the uh, Night's Watch. Oh, and one thing I found kind of useful is we get a total number of existing brothers based on the vote we have here. We get 589 total brothers. Now, I can't remember when I wrote that number down because John doesn't vote in the uh, second election. The, so was the it 589 was... or 588 or 590? Oh, yeah. Yes, it was, it was either five. Yeah, it was one of those. 588 between, five, between that and 590. So yeah. <laughs> somewhere around there. But that's kind of kind of useful we we've had a lot of uh loss in the night's watch and so uh it's kind of hard to know exactly where the numbers stand so we're somewhere around 590 which is not great and so as we mentioned the chapter closes with sam thinking about talking to superiors about working together on a succession plan to their benefit and to keep slint out of power but he has to gird his loins to do it and that's a difficult task for sam so he may or may not do it Again, I think it feels a little flat, but you said you've got a spoiler. Uh, well, it's just a, an idea of why this, why it might have ended the way that it did. Okay. But I think Sam's idea is smart to try and convince Malister and Pike to uh, just pick one of the two and back the other. But it feels like you might as well ask Jonas Bracken to throw a birthday party for Titus Blackwood. <laughs> you know, the the Malister's worst enemies are the Ironborn, of which Cotter Pike is. So, but but you're supposed to put that 
old house disputes behind when you join the Night's Watch. You're brothers now, right? So hopefully they can come to some sort of agreement here. And so now we're going to have a brief digression where we talk about spoilers, which will be edited out of the uh, main uh, uh, recording, but will be available to our sustainers. So think about joining if you want to hear this. All right. Do you have some background for us? Yeah, I got some. There wasn't a great deal. And we've talked about some of these things recently. But so, again, when discussing the idea of Sam sending Gilly and the baby to Horn Hill, John mentions that it's not unheard of for bastards to be trained as squires and raised to knights. We've talked about that plenty this this episode. And there are plenty of examples throughout history to support it. One such example we just talked about back in Davis 6 of this book. You might recall Roland Storm, a.k.a. the Bastard of Night Song. He was one of the men helping Davis smuggle Edric out of Dragonstone. He's the natural-born son of Lord Brian Cairn and the half-brother to Bryce Cairn. Sorry, I get their names mixed up sometimes. Anyway, Bryce Cairn, his brother, was the late Lord of Night Song, uh, who became Lord after their father died. You might remember that he led the rear guard that allowed Stannis to successfully retreat after the debacle that was the Battle of the Blackwater. So John's right. Being a bastard might not allow a man to become the lord of his castle. However, if he's handy with a sword or lance, he can build a reputation of his own and earn the respect of others in the realm. Of course, some bastards can go the other way as well. You might recall Damon the First Blackfire, born Damon Waters, the bastard son of King Aegon IV and Aegon's cousin Dana. Damon was legitimized on King Aegon's deathbed, and he and his line continued to be a thorn in the legitimate Targaryens' collective sides for generations. That said, Damon was the youngest man to ever receive knighthood at the ripe old age of 12. So again, a bastard can definitely reach knighthood even at the age of 12 although i will say he was knighted by his father so possibly there was some nepotism involved there yeah all right comparison with the television show i've been holding off on this for a long time but sam and gilly were back at castle black much earlier in the tv show they were present for the entire battle with the wildlings Uh, in fact janice slint bumped into gilly when he was finding a broom closet in which to hide during the heat of the battle oh which is kind of a funny scene Uh, yes after the battle, John recommends to Stannis that he burn all the dead, because he knows what will happen. Maester Aemon says a few nice words over the dead Night's Watch brothers. Uh, Gren took the role of Donald Noy in the battle, and it, so he's one of the corpses on the pyre. Oh, okay. Oh, we lose Gren there. I didn't realize we, we lost yeah. Gren there. Um, Selyse and Shireen are present. They watch on as the dead brothers are burned. Uh, John gets his first view of Melisande through the flames, kind of like a oh. bit of bit of imagery. Uh, okay. John visits both Tormund and Mance in captivity. Uh, the former assures John that Ygritte loved him. Um, because Cold Hands was basically dropped, Sam is able to confide in John that he saw Bran. Oh wow! I'd forgotten all about that. Okay. Yeah. There is no Val, Dalla, or Mance's baby, as that I remember. I haven't found them yet. (laughs) Okay, uh, Pedantry Corner, I've got some this week. Um, As Sam rode along the wall and got found by the Night's Watch brothers, there is a sentence which reads uh, that he was, well, part of it reads, he was always within sight of the wall. That might be the most redundant thing that uh, George (laughs) Martin ever wrote. Assuming that the planet is about the size of planet Earth, you'd have to be more than 40 miles south of the wall to not be able to see it. Of course they were within you'd, sight of the wall. You'd have to be riding with the with John and Steer and the uh the wildling rangers that went like a hundred exactly. miles south of the wall. That's that, that's what they were doing. I've realized now they just wanted to get out, out of sight. Let's just ride until we're out of sight of the wall. Right. Jeez. Then we'll know we've gone far enough. Four <laughs> days later. I suppose on a foggy day you might not be able to see it from any distance, but I mean Well, yeah. Still. <laughs> I take your point, yes. It's good to have you back. We've missed your pedantic (laughs) self. (laughs) Uh, News and notes. Um, I've got one off the cuff here, actually. Um, We we were talking about um, Spotify Wrapped last week, yes? Yes, yes. And thanks again to all our listeners for posting their Spotify Wrapped. It's very funny. Um, It's really really thrilling to see them, actually. I'm I'm, I'm very happy about all of those. Um, 
what made me laugh about that since then is that um, Jimmy Kimmel, who's a late night uh, comedian here, um, he uh-huh. talked about his Spotify rap. I don't know if you saw this, but he was saying his Spotify rap was kind of like a, a it, it was the music part. And he said it was very sobering to see his musical choices for the year. He said it really aged him to see what he listens to. He said, <laughs> if I'd shown my Spotify rap to my pharmacist, they would have given me Lipitor without prescription. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me smile. Uh, wouldn't it have been something if we were on Jimmy Kimmel's rap? <laughs> yeah, that's list. right. He turns his phone around and there's the raven. <laughs> <laughs> and in GOH news, we're going to take a couple weeks off at the end of the year for the holidays. Uh, haven't exactly worked it out yet, but there will be a week or two break where... Uh, uh, you won't hear us blather on. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's 200 plus episodes to choose from. Go, go back and listen. Go back and listen to what Stacy did to that bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is still one of my favorite episodes. I crack up about that one. <laughs> and of course, well, one of those weeks we will put out our 2023 outtakes episode, which is really long right now. I've oh, got to go through and shorten it. It's it's like. Into the teens of minutes, I believe, of uh, oh, well, outtakes. Yeah. So <laughs> that's all I've got. Not a whole lot in news and notes this week. No, that's good. Well, I'll tell you, I'm actually going to, um, for New Year, I've been invited up to the mountains to a, a mountain cabin Ooh. where we stayed a couple of times, which we really like. And so uh, that, we're that'll very be cool. About that. yeah. yeah, that'll be beautiful, I bet. Yeah. I'm hoping I get snowed in for like three weeks, would be perfect. <laughs> All right, let's conclude this one. Sam and John are reunited, yay! But it already happened, yeah. so we didn't really get to. So we just see the afterglow of it. Yeah, what's with that? Don't, don't doesn't Martin think we would have liked to have seen that, or at least been given the uh, the image from Our a feelings flashback? are not top of his agenda. Just so you know, I guess not. And the fact that John is in uh, is such a low right now. I think Sam kind of says, "Yeah, he said good. To, you did good, Sam." You made it back with Gilly and the baby. Good job. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> uh, Gilly helping uh, Val tend to Dalla and Mance's baby is a nice touch. Uh, and yeah. But we need to worry about Dalla's future. Or We do. We definitely do. Where she is. And uh, Melisandre has claimed Mance as hers, I think, uh-huh. is, is what's going on there. Uh, you know, we were discussing why. Why burn... Mance, what what are you going to gain it gain from it? You know, if, if Stannis is here in the north to fight the great other, then maybe a whole body of a king's blood might go a long way to help with that particular fight. True, you know, absolutely and, true. And, yeah, and, and maybe the the way it will do that is by waking the stone dragons, as Edric Storm's blood was promised to do. Right. <laughs> uh, I do wonder if John will have something to say about this. He's not one to uh, bite his tongue when he sees a wrong about to be committed. He does struggle with that sometimes, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sam's still not sure what to do about Gilly and the baby. Uh, the, t- the idea of sending them to Horn Hill might have some legs. Uh, yeah. But it would be a kind of like, it would be, a, it's a good solution, but it's a bit mundane. You know, we kind of like Sam's relationship with Gilly and we kind of want it to continue. And right. actually solving the problem would stop it. Yeah, that's kind of, we're kind of torn there as readers of the the story because we like seeing them together but she can't just hang out at castle black forever yes yes. so in in order to resolve it the best way to do it you know that's that's certainly an option as one of the best ways to yeah to to make this work and dolores had survived and we're very happy about that i was i always have a special moment whenever we mention serial forel or dolores ed because they're, they're the two cameos who thanked us, you know, so I always, yes. always picture them. As I'm saying they are, us. yes. And his story about uh, Watt of Long Lake was quite funny. We we don't really have time to go into it. Well, I guess he's talking about how he didn't get, he didn't win the Arrow contest. Remember they had oh, um, that's right. stuffed brothers of the Night's Watch, and he had been leading with the most arrows until the last day when Watt of Long Lake got like four or something and, and ended up winning. And Ed tells this story about how, oh, I never win anything, but the gods always shine on Watt of Long Lake. When he got knocked off the Bridge of Skulls, he landed in a deep pool of water, entirely missing all the rocks on the way down. And Gren was like, so did 
did it save his life? And he said, oh, no, he was dead from the axe in his head, but still <laughs> lucky for missing all those rocks. <laughs> oh, funny. Uh, funny story. Ed is good. Uh, yes. No sign of ghost. We do worry about ghosts, but I like your idea. Maybe he's gone uh, looking for Summer and Bran. Yeah, maybe he figures, well, Bran needs me right now more yeah, than yeah. you do, John. So, And, uh, yeah, it won't be good if Slint wins. No. Uh, the Lord Commandership here. No. Yeah, Sam needs to go sort that out. Yeah. He's just, Slint's just totally unprepared for what's coming and how to deal with the wildling situation. And yeah. yeah, one thing we know about Slint's time, and probably these brothers don't know, although a lot of them might, because a lot of them are probably prisoners in King's Very Landing point, at some yes. point. So they might be aware of just how corrupt the gold cloaks were under Slint's watch. And it's very possible that Night's Watch would follow suit yeah, in that very true. situation. Um, you remember the theme music to Game of Thrones, the um, the models of the various locations? Yes. Um, and yes. then it would swing to the next one, sort of like across the narrow sea to Essos kind of thing. And uh, you yeah. know, taking in 10,000 miles in one sweep. That's what we're going to do next week, right? Which coming from all the way from uh, <laughs> Sam to uh, who have we got next week? Uh, I was wondering where you were going with that. We're going about ten feet. <laughs> uh, John, you say? Oh, yeah, he's right. Yes, and I promised to say to mention why I thought Sam's uh, ending of Sam's chapter was kind of uh, actually underwhelming. No, oh, okay. And and I think it's underwhelming because it's only part one of the story. I see. I get it now. We're, All right. We're we're looking at the first half of Sam, and now the next chapter will be John kind of dealing with the same stuff so i think that gotcha. could be why it was intentionally flat all right there's four ways that you can help us you could leave us a five-star rating and a positive review you could buy some merchandise including the new design at ghosts of com. you could buy us a cup of arbor gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghosts harrenhal or become a sustainer there to keep us going on an ongoing basis uh, or just donate directly to our cause through our website ghosts of and if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keep up on the latest Ghost of Heron Hall news and information, you can always go out and follow us on our social medias. We're on Twitter at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.